So we've learned that the diurnal motion of the Earth, the daily turning due to the Earth's rotation, that gives uh, rise to the rising and setting of stars. Uh, the annual motion, that's due to the motion of the Earth around the sun, that makes the sky shift about a degree or so every day. Uh, you put the two together, we get timekeeping. How do we keep track of time uh, according to the sky? Uh, so, but there's a couple other motions here about the sky, about the Earth's orbit around the sun, and how it affects things that I want to talk about. Uh, the first one's actually uh, there in chapter two, and that is stellar motion due to precession. Uh, turns out Earth's orbit, uh, Earth, Earth is tilted on its axis 23 and a half degrees. Well, interesting thing uh, in physics, if you have like a top or something that's spinning, and you tilt it over, then what happens is rather than falling over, gravity pulling on it actually makes it s spin around and change what direction it's pointing. So the term for that is precession. Now, Earth is a great big spinning thing, and the gravity of the moon and the planets and the sun are pulling on it, and so that changes the direction the Earth points in the sky. And so over time, then Earth points in different spots. Now, the whole point of it pointing in one spot is why we have celestial coordinates the way that we do. Uh, for example, the Earth is currently pointed at the star Polaris. The North Pole is pointed at Polaris, and so it's the North Star. But if the North Pole of the Earth were to point at a different star, then that star would be the North Star. And so uh, over time, the Earth does shift. Now, it doesn't do it very quickly. It takes 26,000 years for the Earth to make one complete circuit and change the direction that's pointing. And so right now, as I said, we happen to be pointed very close to the star Polaris. Okay. But thousands of years ago, when they were building the pyramids in Egypt, we were pointed at the star Thuban. So the entire sky was shifted a little bit. Uh, and the star that we now call Polaris was obviously not called Polaris because that means pole star. The star was named Sinosura and had an entirely different name to it. Um, as time passes, it's no longer going to be the North Star. So years from now, then the Earth will be pointing to a spot where there is no particularly bright star. There's not going to be a well-defined North Star. Uh, if you go out at night and look for the North Star, a lot of students are very disappointed. When I do the night labs, this is one of the things we do. We go out and I say point at the North Star, and everybody points at something that's really bright, and so there's the North Star. Because when they were a kid, they were told the North Star is the brightest star in the sky. Well, that's not right. The North Star is not the brightest star in the sky. It's not even close to the brightest star in the sky. And in fact, from campus, where we do a lot of our labs, it's actually a little bit hard to find because it's so dim. And so uh, the only thing that makes it special is it hangs in one spot up there. And so you can use that as a navigation aid. So it's the North Star, Polaris. Uh, if you want to find a bright star as the North Star, wait about 10,000 years or so, and then the, the North Pole of the Earth, we pointed kind of close to the star Vega. And so Vega will be the North Star, but you've got to wait about 10,000 years or so for Vega to be the North Star. And so uh, that's, 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 I mean, that's coming up. You probably won't live that long, you know, but, you know, in case you do, uh, uh, in case you get bitten by a vampire or something and, and, and you turn into a vampire and you're still, still around 10,000 years, go out and look and Vegas is going to be the North Star. Okay. So this actually has an interesting uh, effect. We'll get to in a little bit. Okay. Earth is changing the direction it's pointing in the sky because of this effect of precession. But the other thing that happens is that Earth is actually changing the wobble in the sky slightly, okay, the obliquity. And so or this is called the inclination, how much is tilted. So the, how oblique the orbit, uh, the tilt of the Earth's orbit or the inclination, that is also uh, changing back and forth. Right now, we're about 23 and a half degrees. 
so ov over a long period of time, 41,000 years or so, it shifts back and forth by several degrees. And so uh, that's, that's an interesting, interesting thing. Remember, this causes the seasons. The tilt of the earth causes the seasons. So we're constantly changing the tilt. That's got to have some impact on, on climate here. Uh, interesting thing about that is as Earth does this, this changing, and now the mutation actually has several cycles. It has a big cycle and a small cycle. Small cycle is just, just a few dozen years, and the big cycle is, is tens of thousands of years. But um, in Taiwan, they actually had an interesting thing. They, the, they had a, a, a national park that was built right on the Tropic of Cancer because the Tropic of Cancer runs right through uh, the, the island. And so at noon on, on the, the summer solstice, the sun would shine straight down uh, through, uh, on, uh, through this obelisk, through, through a, a, a sphere at the top, and an and image right down there, and only on that one day of the year. Well, what's happened is that the Earth's inclination has shifted, and so that means the Tropic of Cancer has moved, and it actually, you know, is no longer doing that anymore uh, uh, because it has moved slightly. Uh, in Mexico, there's actually the Tropic of Cancer runs right through Mexico, and what has happened is there's actually a professor in Mexico uh, that that goes out every year and stakes where the Tropic of Cancer is located. Uh, uh, so so it's marked as to where it is uh, different at diff on different years, and so that. Uh, is due to nutation. So, so we have these two different kinds of motion. Now, what does that do? Well, that means if you change where the North Pole is pointing, you also change where the equator is. If you change where the equator is located, that change, changes the zero of declination, which change, means all the stars, uh, all the coordinates of all the objects in the sky shift declination as this happens. Well, the other thing is you change what direction the North Pole is, that's going to change where the, uh, where the, the right ascension lines run. And so that means it's also going to change where the sun crosses the equator. Now, this is one of the things I don't like about right ascension, and that is the place they chose as the celestial prime meridian, uh, we call it the equinoctial collier, it runs right through where the, the ecliptic crosses the celestial equator. But if you keep changing the North Pole and the tilt and the direction of the tilt, then that means you change where the uh, uh, sun crosses the celestial equator. That means the celestial prime meridian changes. If that happens, that means the right ascension of everything in the sky changes. So that means that right ascension and declination change on a regular basis uh, over the course of time. And so that means that, that if you are making a map of the sky, you need to be aware that the right ascension and declination are going to be different at different times. And so most maps of the sky list what is called the epoch of the map. The epoch of the map is what year it's actually good for. And you can actually be very specific and say, was it beginning of the year, middle of the year, or end of the year? If you want to be very precise for navigation purposes, you need to know the right ascension and declination of everything at a particular moment in time, at a particular day. Um, most of the time, you don't need to be that precise, and so you just need a map that's, that's pretty close. And so you might sometimes see like J2000 on a map. That would be the epoch of Julian year 2000, so that would be the, the uh, year 2000 uh, uh, beginning of the year if it's 0.0. If it's 0.5, it's like halfway through the year. And so uh, most maps are like Epic 2000 or Epic 1950 or Epic 1900. Uh, I guess in not too many distant years, they're going to start to have Epic uh, 2050 as, as these maps. Uh, now, on Stellarium, if you click on a star, so you click on a star, it's going to give you a list of all kind of information about that star uh, for the lab. And so it will give you the name of the star. It will give you coordinates. Well, this is the interesting thing. If you look carefully, 
there's actually two sets of coordinates that are given. One set of coordinates is the Epoch 2000 coordinates. So that's where it was in the year 2000. That's a standard. So that way you compare it to other things. So you look at where something is one year, where something else is in another year. What you want to do is compare how much it moved. So you want to use the same system of coordinates for both. So Epoch 2000 coordinates is, is convenient. The other place that you would look is the right ascension declination of date, and that would tell you the exact right ascension and declination on that day. If you look in the year 2000, it turns out the two are the same, but if you look at any other year, they're slightly off. And so there's, there's different reasons you might want to use one or the other. So these are two of the changes that can happen in Earth's orbit. Okay, so I'm going to next cover two more possible changes in Earth's orbit. One of the other things that can happen is that by dragging uh, the, 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 uh, the force of the, the gravity of the other planets can drag on Earth and actually alter the shape of the orbit. So we can change the eccentricity of the orbit. So we can change how out of round it is because the Earth's orbit's a little bit elliptical. We make it more elliptical or less elliptical. Okay. Now, there's another thing that happens, and that is the apsidal precession. And so that means that, that the orbit uh, doesn't follow an exact path. It looks like a little spiral graph that goes around the sun. And so what happens is that the exact time in the orbit, the exact time of year that you reach perihelion is slightly different from, you know, from one year to the next. And so that's actually one way of measuring a year is perihelion to perihelion. Another way of measuring year is from equinox to equinox. Another way of measuring year is from from you know lining it with stars to lining it with stars so there's just as there's different ways of measuring days there's different ways of measuring years uh, and, but again that means that sometimes we are closest to the sun uh, uh, in the summertime and sometimes we're closer to the sun in the winter time and so this changes it slightly over the course of thousands of years so you put all this together and what this does is it changes how sunlight hits Earth. And when that does that, that's going to affect the climate. So putting this together, when you change the tilt of the Earth, okay, or you change the direction of the tilt of the Earth, those two things will change, they'll influence your celestial coordinates. So that will mean your, your right ascension and declination change a little bit. But the other thing that happens is that the inclination, that's the tilt, or the orientation, the direction it's pointing, the line of apsides, the eccentricity, how elliptical it is, all of these things, they affect the climate and the seasons. Uh, the, the, uh, the cycles of changing the, the uh, uh, eccentricity, uh, that actually relates very closely to the ice ages. And so there, there are all these different effects that can happen to Earth by these orbital changes. And these orbital changes are happening all the time. Granted, they're happening very slowly, but they are happening. And so th these are some of the ways that what's going on in space affects us here on Earth.